the method of scientific investigation by thomas henry huxley this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by abai in september 2017 the method of scientific investigation the method of scientific investigation is nothing but the expression of the necessary mode of working of the human mind it is simply the mode at which all phenomena are reasoned about rendered precise and exact there is no more difference but there is just the same kind of difference between the mental operations of a man of science and those of an ordinary person as there is between the operations and methods of a baker or of a butcher weighing out his goods in common scales and the operations of a chemist in performing a difficult and complex analysis by means of his balance and finely graduated weights it is not that the action of the scales in the one case and the balance in the other differ in the principles of their construction or manner of working but the beam of one is set on an infinitely finer axis than the other and of course turns by the addition of a much smaller weight you will understand this better perhaps if i give you some familiar example you have all heard it repeated i dare say that men of science work by means of induction and deduction and that by the help of these operations they in a sort of sense wring from nature certain other things which are called natural laws and causes and that out of these by some cunning skill of their own they build up hypotheses and theories and it is imagined by many that the operations of the common mind can be by no means compared with these processes and that they have to be acquired by a sort of special apprenticeship to the craft to hear all these large words you would think that the mind of a man of science must be constituted differently from that of his fellow men but if you will not be frightened by terms you will discover that you are quite wrong and that all these terrible apparatus are being used by yourselves every day and every hour of your lives there is a well-known incident in one of moliere's plays where the author makes the hero express unbounded delight on being told that he had been talking prose during the whole of his life in the same way i trust that you will take comfort and be delighted with yourselves on the discovery that you have been acting on the principles of inductive and deductive philosophy during the same period probably there is not one here who has not in the course of the day had occasion to set in motion a complex train of reasoning of the very same kind though differing of course in degree as that which a scientific man goes through in tracing the causes of natural phenomena a very trivial circumstance will serve to exemplify this suppose you go into a fruiterer's shop wanting an apple you take up one and on biting it you find it is sour you look at it and see that it is hard and green you take up another one and that too is hard green and sour the shopman offers you a third but before biting it you examine it and find that it is hard and green and you immediately say that you will not have it as it must be sour like those that you have already tried nothing can be more simple than that you think but if you will take the trouble to analyze and trace out into its logical elements what has been done by the mind you will be greatly surprised in the first place you have performed the operation of induction you found that in two experiences hardness and greenness in apples went together with sourness it was so in the first case and it was confirmed by the second true it is a very small basis but still it is enough to make an induction form you generalize the facts and you expect to find sourness in apples where you get hardness and greenness you found upon that a general law that all hard and green apples are sour and that so far as it goes is a perfect induction well having got your natural law in this way when you are offered another apple which you find is hard and green you say 
all hard and green apples are sour this apple is hard and green therefore this apple is sour that train of reasoning is what logicians call a syllogism and has all its various parts and terms its major premise its minor premise and its conclusion and by the help of further reasoning which if drawn out would have to be exhibited in two or three other syllogisms you arrive at your final determination i will not have that apple so that you see you have in the first place established a law by induction and upon that you have founded a deduction and reasoned out the special particular case well now suppose having got your conclusion of the law that at some time afterwards you are discussing the qualities of apples with a friend you will say to him it is a very curious thing but i find that all hard and green apples are sour your friend says to you but how do you know that you at once reply oh because i have tried them over and over again and have always found them to be so well if we were talking science instead of common sense we should call that an experimental verification and if still opposed you go further and say i have heard from the people in somersetshire and devonshire where a large number of apples are grown that they have observed the same thing it is also found to be the case in normandy and in north america in short i find it to be the universal experience of mankind wherever attention has been directed to the subject whereupon your friend unless he is a very unreasonable man agrees with you and is convinced that you are quite right in the conclusion you have drawn he believes although perhaps he does not know he believes it that the more extensive verifications are that the more frequently experiments have been made and results of the same kind arrived at that the more varied the conditions under which the same results are obtained the more certain is the ultimate conclusion and he disputes the question no further he sees that the experiment has been tried under all sorts of conditions as to time place and people with the same result and he says with you therefore that the law you have laid down must be a good one and he must believe it in science we do the same thing the philosopher exercises precisely the same faculties though in a much more delicate manner in scientific inquiry it becomes a matter of duty to expose a supposed law to every possible kind of verification and to take care moreover that this is done intentionally and not left to a mere accident as in the case of the apples and in science as in common life our confidence in a law is in exact proportion to the absence of variation in the result of our experimental verifications for instance if you let go your grasp of an article you may have in your hand it will immediately fall to the ground that is a very common verification of one of the best established laws of nature that of gravitation the method by which men of science establish the existence of that law is exactly the same as that by which we have established the trivial proposition about the sourness of hard and green apples but we believe it in such an extensive thorough and unhesitating manner because the universal experience of mankind verifies it and we can verify it ourselves at any time and that is the strongest possible foundation on which any natural law can rest so much then by way of proof that the method of establishing laws in science is exactly the same as that pursued in common life let us now turn to another matter though really it is but another phase of the same question and that is the method by which from the relations of certain phenomena we prove that some stand in the position of causes towards the others i want to put the case clearly before you and i will therefore show you what i mean by another familiar example i will suppose that one of you on coming down in the morning to the parlour of your house finds that a teapot and some spoons which had been left in the room on the previous evening are gone the window is open and you observe the mark of a dirty hand on the window frame and perhaps in addition to that 
you notice the impress of a hobnailed shoe on the gravel outside. All these phenomena have struck your attention instantly, and before two seconds have passed you say, Oh, somebody has broken open the window, entered the room, and run off with the spoons and the teapot. That speech is out of your mouth in a moment, and you will probably add, I know there has, I'm quite sure of it. You mean to say exactly what you know, but in reality you are giving expression to what is, in all essential particulars, a hypothesis. You do not know it at all. It is nothing but a hypothesis rapidly framed in your own mind. And it is a hypothesis founded on a long train of inductions and deductions. What are those inductions and deductions, and how have you got at this hypothesis? You have observed in the first place that the window is open, but by a train of reasoning involving many inductions and deductions, you have probably arrived long before at the general law, and a very good one it is, that windows do not open of themselves, and you therefore conclude that something has opened the window. A second general law that you have arrived at in the same way is that teapots and spoons do not go out of a window spontaneously, and you are satisfied that, as they are not now where you left them, they have been removed. In the third place you look at the marks on the window sill and the shoe marks outside, and you say that in all previous experience the former kind of mark has never been produced by anything else but the hand of a human being and the same experience shows that no other animal but man at present wears shoes with hobnails in them such as would produce the marks in the gravel. I do not know, even if we could discover any of those missing links that are talked about, that they would help us to any other conclusion. At any rate, the law which states our present experience is strong enough for my present purpose. You next reach the conclusion that, as these kind of marks have not been left by any other animal than man, or are liable to be formed in any other way than a man's hand and shoe, the marks in question have been formed by a man in that way. You have, further, a general law, founded on observation and experience, and that too is, I am sorry to say, a very universal and unimpeachable one that some men are thieves, and you assume at once from all these premises, and that is what constitutes your hypothesis, that the man who made the marks outside and on the window sill, opened the window, got into the room, and stole your teapot and spoons. You have now arrived at a vera causa. You have assumed a cause, which, it is plain, is competent to produce all the phenomena you have observed. You can explain all these phenomena only by the hypothesis of a thief. But that is a hypothetical conclusion, of the justice of which you have no absolute proof at all. It is only rendered highly probable by a series of inductive and deductive reasonings. I suppose your first action, assuming that you are a man of ordinary common sense, and that you have established this hypothesis to your own satisfaction, will very likely be to go off for the police and set them on the track of the burglar with the view to the recovery of your property. But just as you are starting with this object, some person comes in, and on learning what you are about says, My good friend, you are going on a great deal too fast. How do you know that the man who really made the marks took the spoons? It might have been a monkey that took them, and the man may have merely looked in afterwards you would probably reply, well, that is all very well, but you see it is contrary to all experience of the way teapots and spoons are abstracted, so that at any rate your hypothesis is less probable than mine. While you are talking the thing over in this way, another friend arrives, one of the good kind of people that I was talking of a little while ago. And he might say, Oh, my dear sir, you are certainly going on a great deal too fast. You are most presumptuous. You admit that all these occurrences took place when you were fast asleep, at a time when you could not possibly have known anything about what was taking place. How do you know that the laws of nature are not suspended during the night? 
it may be that there has been some kind of supernatural interference in this case in point of fact he declares that your hypothesis is one of which you cannot at all demonstrate the truth and that you are by no means sure that the laws of nature are the same when you are asleep as when you are awake well now you cannot at the moment answer that kind of reasoning you feel that your worthy friend has you somewhat at a disadvantage you will feel perfectly convinced in your own mind however that you are quite right and you say to him my good friend i can only be guided by the natural probabilities of the case and if you will be kind enough to stand aside and permit me to pass i will go and fetch the police well we will suppose that your journey is successful and that by good luck you meet with a policeman that eventually the burglar is found with your property on his person and the marks correspond to his hand and to his boots probably any jury would consider those facts a very good experimental verification of your hypothesis touching the cause of the abnormal phenomena observed in your parlour and would act accordingly now in this suppositious case i have taken phenomena of a very common kind in order that you might see what are the different steps in an ordinary process of reasoning if you will only take the trouble to analyze it carefully all the operations i have described you will see are involved in the mind of any man of sense in leading him to a conclusion as to the course he should take in order to make good a robbery and punish the offender i say that you are led in that case to your conclusion by exactly the same train of reasoning as that which a man of science pursues when he is endeavouring to discover the origin and laws of the most occult phenomena the process is and always must be the same and precisely the same mode of reasoning was employed by newton and laplace in their endeavours to discover and define the causes of the movements of the heavenly bodies as you with your own common sense would employ to detect a burglar the only difference is that the nature of the inquiry being more abstruse every step has to be most carefully watched so that there may not be a single crack or flaw in your hypothesis a flaw or crack in many of the hypotheses of daily life may be of little or no moment as affecting the general correctness of the conclusions at which we may arrive but in a scientific inquiry a fallacy great or small is always of importance and is sure to be in the long run constantly productive of mischievous if not fatal results do not allow yourselves to be misled by the common notion that an hypothesis is untrustworthy simply because it is a hypothesis it is often urged in respect to some scientific conclusion that after all it is only a hypothesis but what more have we to guide us in nine-tenths of the most important affairs of daily life than hypotheses and often very ill-based ones so that in science where the evidence of a hypothesis is subjected to the most rigid examination we may rightly pursue the same course you may have hypotheses and hypotheses a man may say if he likes that the moon is made of green cheese that is a hypothesis but another man who has devoted a great deal of time and attention to the subject and availed himself of the most powerful telescopes and the results of the observations of others declares that in his opinion it is probably composed of materials very similar to those of which our own earth is made up and that is also only a hypothesis but i need not tell you that there is an enormous difference in the value of the two hypotheses that one which is based on sound scientific knowledge is sure to have a corresponding value and that which is a mere hasty random guess is likely to have but little value every great step in our progress in discovering causes has been made in exactly the same way as that which i have detailed to you a person observing the occurrence of certain facts and phenomena asks naturally enough what process what kind of operation known to occur in nature applied to the particular case will unravel and explain the mystery 
Hence you have the scientific hypothesis, and its value will be proportionate to the care and completeness with which its basis has been tested and verified. It is in these matters as in the commonest affairs of practical life. The guess of the fool will be folly, while the guess of the wise man will contain wisdom. In all cases, you see, that the value of the result depends on the patience and faithfulness with which the investigator applies to his hypothesis every possible kind of verification. End of The Method of Scientific Investigation by Thomas Henry Huxley Interview of Mrs. Many Folks by the Work Projects Administration. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Ferrard. Interview of Mrs. Many Folks from The Slave Narratives, Virginia by the Work Projects Administration. 459 East Burns Street, Petersburg, Virginia by Susie Burry, March 5th, 1937. I was born the 25th of December, and I am 77 years old. My mother was a slave, and she belonged to Dick Belcher in Chesterfield County. Old Dick sold us again to Galasp Graves. Men were now fifteen, and mother's children went with her, having the same master. Honey, I don't like to talk about them times, cause my mother did suffer misery. You know there was an overseer who used to tie mother up in the barn with a rope around her arms up over her head while she stood on a block. Soon as they got her tied, this block was moved and her feet dangled, you know, couldn't catch the flow. This old man now would start beating her naked till the blood run down her back to her heels. I took and seed the whelps and scars for my own self with these here two eyes was a whip like they used to use on horses it was a piece of leather about as wide as my hand from little finger to thumb after they had beat my mama all day wanted another overseer lord lord i hate white people and the flood waters gwine drown some long well honey this man would bathe her in salt and water don't you know dem places was a hurtin mm -mm. i asked my mother what she done for and to be and do her so she said nothing t'other than she refused to be wife to this man and mama say if he didn't treat her this way a dozen times it wasn't nary one mind you now mama's master didn't know this was going on you know if slaves would tell why them overseers would kill em and she said that they used to have meetings and sing and pray and the old paterolas would hit em so to keep the sound from going out slaves would put a great big iron pot at the door and you know sometimes they would forget to put old pot there and the paterolas would come and horsewhip every last one of them just cause poor souls were praying to god to free em from that awful bondage ha 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 dar was one old brother who studied for em one day and told all the slaves how to get even with him he told em to tie grapevines and other vines across the road then when de patty rollers come gallantin with their horses running so fast you see dem vines would tangle em up and cause the horses to stumble and fall and lots of times hadly they would break their legs and horses too one interval one old poor devil got tangled so and the horse kept a carrying him till he fell off horse and next day a sucker was found in road while dem vines was wind round his neck so many times yes had choked him they said he totally dead serve him right cause dem old white folks treated us so mean well sometimes you know they would the others of them keep going till they find why this meeting was gwine on they would come in 
and stop whipping and beating the slaves unmerciful all this was done to keep you from serving god and do you know some of them devils was mean and sinful enough to say if i catch you here again serving god i'll beat you you haven't time to serve god we fought you to serve us mm -mm. god's gwine rob dem wicked monsters if it taint em what gets hit it's gonna fall on their children in dem back days child meetings was carried on just like we do today somewhatly only difference is the slave dat knowed the most about de bible would tell and explain what god had told him in a vision your young folks say dream dat dis freedom would come to pass and den dey prayed for this vision to come to pass and dars where well, de patty rollers would whip em again lord lord dey pee 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 baby i just know i could if i knowed how to write and had a little learning i could put off a book on this here situation you know what i mean about this way back questions yo is a askin me to tell you about as far as i can recollect in my mind when graves bought us he sold three of us and three slaves my brother and sister went down south mama said to do de cotton country and too she said they were made to work in the cotton fields by their new master out in dem white fields in the brawling sun from the time it break day till yo couldn't see at night and yes indeedy and if god isn't my righteous judge they were given not half to eat no not not to eat they was beaten if they asked for any more as to marriage when a slave wanted to marry why he would just ask his master to go over and ask the t'other master could he take unto himself this certain gal for a wife mind you now all the slaves that master called out of quarters and he'd make em line up see stand in a row like soldiers and the slave man is with his master when this asking is gwine on and he pulls de gal to him he wants and de master den make both jump over broomstick and after dey does dey is pronounced man and wife both stand with same masters i mean of john mary sally john stay with his old master and sal with hers but had privilege you know like married folks and if chillen were born all of em no matter how many belonged to the master while the woman stayed if i ain't made a mistake i think it was in april when the war surrendered and mama and all us was turned a loose in may yes dat old wench a old heifer old child it makes my blood bile when i think about it yes she kept mama ignorant didn't tell her nothing about being free till then in may then her mistress miss betsy Godsey, told her she was free and she mama could cook for her just the same that she would give her something to eat and help clothe us chillen that was if mama continued to stay with her and work you see we didn't have nothing and no why to go mm -mm -mm. so we all you know just took and stayed till we was able with god's help to pull ourselves together but my god it was against our will but baby couldn't help ourselves my father's master told him he could farm one half for the t'other and when time rolled round for them vited crops he took and give to him his part like any honest man would do ah lord child dem was terrible times too oh it makes me shudder when i think of some slaves had to stay in the woods and get long best way they could after freedom done been cleared you see slaves who had mean master would rather be dar dan while they lived by and by god opened a way and dey got with other slaves who had huts you see after the render no white folks could keep slaves do you know even now honey 
and dat done been way back yonder dese old white folks think us poor colored people is made to work and slave for them look they ain't give you no wages worth nothing gal cook all week for two and three dollars how can you live off it how can how can you my father waited on soldiers and after disrender they carried him and his brother as far as washington d c i think we all used to say den washington city ain't you done heard folks talk about dat city tis a great big city das where de president of dis here country stay and in back days it was known as vitin lin footed north and south i done hear dem white folks tell all about dem things dis line as i was tellin you his brother was kept but dey sent father back home uncle spencer was left in prince williams county all his chillin are still dar i don't know de name of yankee who carried him off lord lord honey dem times too over sad cause yankees took lots of slaves away and dey made homes and whole heap of families lost sight of each other i know of a case where after it was ten years a brother and sister lived side by side and didn't know they was blood kin my views bout to chillin in dem back days is dat dese here chillin what is now comin up is too pison brazen for me no just let me tell you how i did i married when i was fourteen years old so help me god i didn't know what marriage meant i had an idea when you loved a man you and he could be married and his wife had to cook clean up wash and iron for him was all i slept in bed he on his side and i on mine for three months and this ain't no lie miss sue he never got close to me cause mumma had said don't let nobody bother your principal cause that was all you had i bay my mumma and told him so and i said to go and ask mumma and if she said he could get close to me it was all right and he and i went together to see and ask mumma den mumma say come here children and she began telling me to please my husband and twas my duty as a wife that he had married a perfect lady dese here children don't think of their principle run perfectly wild old women too they ain't all true to one but have two just what is getting into this generation is it the world coming to an end ha 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 i'm going to tell you something else i had a young man to come see me one evening and he said this to me miss Moll, let me gin my fence to your plantation i give him his hat i say no yo go your way and i go mine i was through with him and mind you i from that day till this ain't knowed what he was talking about and was ashamed to ask mamma but i thought he insulted me i didn't never go to school had to work and am working now and when hit breaks good weather i go fishing and who works that big garden out dar nobody but me you know i'm mother of eleven children and tis seven little and four dem dead end of interview with mrs many folks of petersburg virginia by the work projects administration poetry for poetry's sake an inaugural lecture delivered on june fifth nineteen o one by a c bradley professor of poetry in the university of oxford this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org poetry for poetry's sake one who after twenty years is restored to the university where he was taught and first tried to teach and who has received at the hands of his alma mater an honor of which he never dreamed is tempted to speak both of himself and of her but i remember that you have come to listen to my thoughts about a great subject and not to my feelings about myself 
and of oxford who that holds this professorship could dare to speak when he recalls the exquisite verse in which one of his predecessors described her beauty and the prose in which he gently touched on her illusions and protested that they were as nothing when set against her age-long warfare with the philistine how again remembering him and others should i venture to praise my predecessors it would be pleasant to do so and even pleasanter to me and you if instead of lecturing i quoted to you some of their best passages but i could not do this for five years sooner or later my own words would have to come and the inevitable contrast not to sharpen it now i will be silent concerning them also and will only assure you that i do not forget them or the greatness of the honour of succeeding them or the responsibility which it entails since i left oxford one change has taken place in its educational system which may be thought to affect the professorship of poetry a school of english language and literature has been founded and has attracted a fair number of candidates naturally i rejoice in this change knowing from experience the value of these studies and knowing also from experience if i may speak boldly how idle is that dream which flits about in oxford and whispers that the mastering of old english on the basis of teutonic phonology and the conquest of the worlds opened by chaucer and shakespeare and swift and burke and twenty more is a business too slight and a discipline not severe enough for undergraduates i should be glad to lighten their labours and if it should seem advisable to those who can judge i propose to give in one of the three terms of the year in addition to my statutory lecture a few others intended specially for those who are reading for the school of english i wish i could do more but i resigned my chair in glasgow with a view to work of another kind and i could not have parted from my students there to whom i am bound by ties of the most grateful affection in order to take up similar duties even in the university of oxford the charming poem with which my predecessor opened his literary career and his admirable contributions to poetical history and criticism proved that it would have been easy to him to devote his lectures to the interpretation of particular poets and poems i believe however that he thought it better to confine himself chiefly to questions in poetics and aesthetics i can well understand his choice but partly because he made it i propose to make another and to discuss these questions if at all only as they are illustrated by particular writers and works still in an inaugural lecture it is customary to take some wider subject and so i fear you may have to-day to lament the truth of addison's remark there is nothing in nature so irksome as general discourses especially when they turn chiefly upon words mine turns entirely upon words the words poetry for poetry's sake recall the famous phrase art for art it is far from my purpose to examine the possible meanings of that phrase or all the questions it involves i propose to state briefly what i understand by poetry for poetry's sake and then after guarding against one or two misapprehensions of the formula to consider more fully a single problem connected with it and i must premise without attempting to justify them certain explanations we are to consider poetry in its essence and apart from the flaws which in most poems accompany their poetry we are to include in the idea of poetry the metrical form and not to regard this as a mere accident or a mere vehicle and finally poetry being poems we are to think of a poem as it actually exists and without aiming here at accuracy we may say that an actual poem is the succession of experiences sounds images thoughts emotions through which we pass when we are reading as poetically as we can of course this imaginative experience if i may use the phrase for brevity differs with every reader and every time of reading a poem exists in innumerable degrees but that insurmountable fact lies in the nature of things and does not concern us now what then does the formula poetry for poetry's sake tell us about this experience it says as i understand it these things first this experience is an end in itself is worth having on its own account has an intrinsic value next its poetic value is this intrinsic worth alone poetry may have also an ulterior value as a means to culture or religion because it conveys instruction or softens the passions or furthers a good cause because it brings the poet fame or money or a quiet conscience 
so much the better. Let it be valued for these reasons, too. But its ulterior worth neither is, nor can directly determine its poetic work as a satisfying imaginative experience, and this is to be judged entirely from within. And to these two positions the formula would add, though not of necessity, a third. The consideration of ulterior ends, whether by the poet in the act of composing, or by the reader in the act of experiencing, tends to lower poetic value. It does so because it tends to change the nature of poetry by taking it out of its own atmosphere. For its nature is to be not a part, nor yet a copy, of the real world, as we commonly understand that phrase, but to be a world by itself, independent, complete, autonomous. And to possess it fully you must enter that world, conform to its laws, and ignore for the time the beliefs, aims, and particular conditions which belong to you in the other world of reality. Of the more serious apprehensions to which these statements may give rise, I will glance only at one or two. The offensive consequences often drawn from the formula, art for art, will be found to attach not to the doctrine that art is an end in itself, but to the doctrine that art is the whole or supreme end of human life. And as this latter doctrine, which seems to me absurd, is in any case quite different from the former, its consequences fall outside my subject. The formula, poetry is an end in itself, has nothing to say on the many questions of moral judgment which arise from the fact that poetry has its place in a many-sided life. For anything it says, the intrinsic value of poetry might be so small, and its ulterior effects so mischievous, that it had better not exist. The formula only tells us that we must not place in antithesis poetry and human good, for poetry is one kind of human good and that we must not determine the intrinsic value of this kind of good by direct reference to another. If we do, we shall find ourselves maintaining what we did not expect. If poetic value lies in the stimulation of religious feelings, lead kindly light is no better a poem than many a tasteless version of a psalm. If in the excitement of patriotism, why is Scots what hay superior to we don't want to fight? If in the mitigation of the passions, the odes of Sappho will win but little praise. If in instruction, Armstrong's art of preserving health should win much. Again, our formula may be accused of cutting poetry away from its connection with life, and this accusation raises so huge a problem that I must ask leave to be dogmatic as well as brief. There is plenty of connection between life and poetry, but it is, so to say, a connection underground. The two may be called different forms of the same thing, one of them having, in the usual sense, reality, but seldom fully satisfying imagination, while the other offers something which satisfies imagination but has not, in the usual sense, full reality. They are parallel developments which nowhere meet, or, if I may use incorrectly a word which will be useful later, they are analogues. Hence we understand one by help of the other, and even in a sense, care for one because of the other. And hence, also, poetry neither is life, nor, strictly speaking, a copy of it. They differ not only because one has more mass and the other a more perfect shape, but they have different kinds of existence. The one touches us as beings occupying a given position in space and time, and having feelings, desires, and purposes due to that position. It appeals to imagination, but appeals to much besides. What meets us in poetry has not a position in the same series of time and space, or, if it has, or had such a position, is taken apart from much that belonged to it there, and therefore it makes no direct appeal to those feelings, desires, or purposes, but speaks only to contemplative imagination, imagination the reverse of empty or emotionless, imagination saturated with the results of real experience, but still contemplative. Thus, no doubt, one main reason why poetry has poetic value for us is that it presents to us in its own way something which we meet in another form in nature or life, and yet the test of its poetic value lies simply in the question whether it satisfies our imagination, the rest of us, our knowledge or conscience, for example, judging it only so far as they appear transmuted in our imagination. So also Shakespeare's knowledge, or his moral insight, Milton's greatness of soul, Shelley's hate of hate and love of love, and that desire to help men by his poetry which influenced this poet or that, not, surely, in the process of composition, 
but in hours of meditation all these have as such no poetical worth they have that worth only when passing through the unity of the poet's being they reappear as qualities of imagination and then are indeed mighty powers in the world of poetry i come to a third misapprehension and so to my main subject this formula it is said empties poetry of its meaning it is really a doctrine of form for form's sake it matters not what a poet says so long as he says the thing well the what is poetically indifferent it is the how that counts matter subject content substance determines nothing there is no subject with which poetry may not deal the form the treatment is everything nay more not only is the matter indifferent but it is the secret of art to eradicate the matter by means of the form phrases and statements like these meet us everywhere in current criticism of literature and the other arts they are the stock in trade of writers who understand of them little more than the fact that somehow or other they are not bourgeois but we find them also seriously used by writers whom we must respect whether they are anonymous or not something like one or another of them might be quoted for example from professor saintsbury the late r a m stevenson schiller goethe himself and they are the watchwords of a school in the one country where aesthetics has flourished they come as a rule from men who either practice one of the arts or from study of it are interested in its methods the general reader a being so general that i may say what i will of him is outraged by them he feels that he is being robbed of almost all that he cares for in a work of art you are asking me he says to look at the dresden madonna as if it were a persian rug you are telling me that the poetic value of hamlet lies solely in its style and versification and that my interest in the man and his fate is only an intellectual or moral interest you pretend that if i want to enjoy the poetry of crossing the bar i must not mind what tennyson says there but must consider solely how he says it but in that case i can care no more for a poem than i do for a set of nonsense verses and i do not believe that the authors of hamlet and crossing the bar regarded their poems thus these antitheses of subject matter substance on the one side form treatment handling on the other are the field through which i especially want in this lecture to indicate a way it is a field of battle and the battle is waged for no trivial cause but the cries of the combatants are terribly ambiguous those phrases of the so-called formalist may each mean five or six different things if they mean one they seem to me chiefly true taken as the general reader not unnaturally takes them they seem to me false and mischievous it would be absurd to pretend that i can end in a few minutes a controversy which concerns the ultimate nature of art and leads perhaps to problems not yet soluble but we can at least draw some plain distinctions which in this controversy are too often confused in the first place then let us take subject in one particular sense let us understand by it that which we have in view when looking at the title of a poem we say that the poet has chosen this or that for his subject the subject in this sense so far as i can discover is generally something real or imaginary as it exists in the mind of fairly cultivated people the subject of paradise lost would be the story of the fall as that story exists in the general imagination of a bible reading people the subject of shelley's stanzas to a skylark would be the ideas which arise in the mind of an educated person when without knowing the poem he hears the word skylark if the title of a poem conveys little or nothing to us the subject appears to be either what we should gather by investigating the title in a dictionary or other book of the kind or else such a brief suggestion as might be offered by a person who had read the poem and who said for example that the subject of the ancient mariner was a sailor who killed an albatross and suffered for his deed now the subject in this sense and i intend to use this word in no other is not as such inside the poem but outside it the content of the stanzas to a skylark are not the ideas suggested by the word skylark to the average man they belong to shelley just as much as the language does the subject therefore is not the matter of the poem at all and its opposite is not the form of the poem but the whole poem the subject is one thing the poem matter and form alike another thing 
this being so it is surely obvious that the poetic value cannot lie in the subject but lies entirely in its opposite the poem how can the subject determine the value when on one and the same subject poems may be written of all degrees of merit and demerit or when a perfect poem may be composed on a subject so slight as a pet sparrow and if macaulay may be trusted a nearly worthless poem on a subject so stupendous as the omnipresence of the deity the formalist is here perfectly right nor is he insisting on something unimportant he is contending against our tendency to take the work of art as a mere copy or reminder of something already in our heads or at the best as a suggestion of some idea as little removed as possible from the familiar the sightseer who promenades a picture gallery remarking that this portrait is so like his cousin or that landscape the very image of his birthplace or who after satisfying himself that one picture is about elijah passes on rejoicing to discover the subject and nothing but the subject of the next what is he but an extreme example of this tendency well but the very same tendency vitiates much of our criticism much criticism of shakespeare for example which with all its cleverness and partial truth still shows that the critic never passed from his own mind into shakespeare's and it may still be traced even in so fine a critic as coleridge as when he dwarfs the sublime struggle of hamlet into the image of his own unhappy weakness hazlitt by no means escaped its influence only the third of that great trio lamb appears almost always to have rendered the conception of the composer again it is surely true that we cannot determine beforehand what subjects are fit for art or name any subject on which a good poem might not possibly be written to divide subjects into two groups the beautiful or elevating and the ugly or vicious and to judge poems according as their subjects belong to one of these groups or the other is to fall into the same pit to confuse with our preconceptions the meaning of the poet what the thing is in the poem he is to be judged by not by the thing as it was before he touched it and how can we venture to say beforehand that he cannot make a true poem out of something which to us was merely alluring or dull or revolting the question whether having done so he ought to publish his poem whether the thing in the poet's work will not be still confused by the incompetent puritan or the incompetent sensualist with the thing in his mind does not touch this point it is a further question one of ethics not of art no doubt the upholders of art for art's sake will generally be in favor of the courageous course of refusing to sacrifice the better or stronger part of the public to the weaker or worse but their maxim in no way binds them to this view dante rossetti suppressed one of the best of his sonnets a sonnet chosen for admiration by tennyson himself extremely sensitive about the moral effect of poetry suppressed it i believe because it was called fleshly one may regret rossetti's judgment and at the same time admire his scrupulousness but in any case he judged in his capacity of citizen not in his capacity of artist so far then the formalist appears to be right but he goes too far i think if he maintains that the subject is indifferent and that all subjects are the same to poetry and he does not prove his point by observing that a good poem might be written on a pin's head and a bad one on the fall of man that shows that the subject settles nothing but not that it counts for nothing the fall of man is really a more favorable subject than a pin's head the fall of man that is to say offers opportunities of poetic effects wider in range and more penetrating in appeal and the truth is that such a subject as it exists in the general imagination has some aesthetic value before the poet touches it it is as you may choose to call it an inchoate poem or the debris of a poem it is not an abstract idea or a bare isolated fact but an assemblage of figures scenes actions and events which already appeal to emotional imagination and it is already in some degree organized and formed in spite of this a bad poet would make a bad poem on it but then we should say he was unworthy of the subject and we should not say this if he wrote a bad poem on a pin's head conversely a good poem on a pin's head would almost certainly revolutionize its subject far more than a good poem on the fall of man it might transform its subject so completely that we should say the subject may be a pin's head but the substance of the poem has very little to do with it this brings us to another and different antithesis 
those figures scenes events that form part of the subject called the fall of man are not the substance of paradise lost but in paradise lost there are figures scenes and events resembling them in some degree these with much more of the same kind may be described as its substance and may then be contrasted with the measured language of the poem which will be called its form subject is the opposite not of form but of the whole poem substance is within the poem and its opposite form is also within the poem i am not criticizing this antithesis at present but evidently it is quite different from the other it is practically the distinction used in the old-fashioned criticism of epic and drama and it flows down not unsullied from aristotle addison for example in examining paradise lost considers in order the fable the characters the sentiments these will be the substance then he considers the language that is the style and numbers this will be the form in like manner the substance or meaning of a lyric may be distinguished from the form now i believe it will be found that a large part of the controversy we are dealing with arises from a confusion between these two distinctions of substance and form and of subject and poem the extreme formalist lays his whole weight on the form because he thinks its opposite is the mere subject the general reader is angry but makes the same mistake and gives the subject praises that rightly belong to the substance i will read an example of what i mean i can only explain the following words of a good critic by supposing for the moment that he has fallen into this confusion the mere matter of all poetry to wit the appearances of nature and the thoughts and feelings of men being unalterable it follows that the difference between poet and poet will depend upon the manner of each in applying language meter rhyme cadence and what not to this invariable material what has become here of the substance of paradise lost the story scenery characters sentiments as they are in the poem they have vanished clean away nothing is left but the form on one side and on the other not even the subject but a supposed invariable material the appearances of nature and the thoughts and feelings of men is it surprising that the whole value should then be found in the form so far we have assumed that this antithesis of substance and form is valid and that it always has one meaning in reality it has several but we will leave it in its present shape and pass to the question of its validity and this question we are compelled to raise because we have to deal with the two contentions that the poetic value lies wholly or mainly in the substance and that it lies wholly or mainly in the form now these contentions whether false or true may seem at least to be clear but we shall find i think that they are both of them false or both of them nonsense false if they concern anything outside the poem nonsense if they apply to something in it for what do they evidently imply they imply that there are in a poem two parts factors or components a substance and a form and that you can conceive them distinctly and separately so that when you are speaking of the one you are not speaking of the other otherwise how can you ask the question in which of them does the value lie but really in a poem apart from defects there are no such factors or components and therefore it is strictly nonsense to ask in which of them the value lies and on the other hand if the substance and the form referred to are not in the poem then both the contentions are false for its poetic value lies in itself what i mean is neither new nor mysterious and it will be clear i believe to any one who reads poetry poetically and who closely examines his experience when you are reading a poem i would ask not analyzing it and much less criticizing it but allowing it as it proceeds to make its full impression on you through the exertion of your recreating imagination do you then apprehend and enjoy as one thing a certain meaning or substance and as another thing certain articulate sounds and do you somehow compound these two surely you do not any more than you apprehend a part when you see someone smile those lines in the face which express a feeling and the feeling that the lines express just as there the lines and their meaning are to you one thing not two so in poetry the meaning and the sounds are one there is if i may put it so a resonant meaning or a meaning resonance if you read the line the sun is warm the sky is clear you do not experience separately the image of a warm sun and a clear sky on the one side 
and certain unintelligible rhythmical sounds on the other, nor yet do you experience them together side by side, but you experience the one in the other. And in like manner, when you are really reading Hamlet, the action and the characters are not something which you conceive apart from the words. You apprehend them from point to point in the words. Afterwards, no doubt, when you are out of the poetic experience, but remember it, you may by analysis decompose this unity and attend to a substance more or less isolated and a form more or less isolated. But these are things in your analytical head, not in the poem, which is poetic experience. And if you want to have the poem again, you cannot find it by adding together these two products of decomposition. You can only find it by passing back into poetic experience. And then what you have again is no aggregate of factors. It is a unity in which you can no more separate a substance and a form than you can separate living blood and the life in the blood. This unity has, if you like, various aspects or sides, but they are not factors or parts. If you try to examine one, you will find it is also the other. Call them substance and form, if you please, but these are not the reciprocally exclusive substance and form to which the two contentions must refer. They do not agree, for they are not apart. They are one thing from different points of view, and in this sense identical. And this identity of content and form, you will say, is no accident. It is of the essence of poetry in so far as it is poetry, and of all art in so far as it is art. Just as there is in music not sound on one side and a meaning on the other, but expressive sound. And if you ask what is the meaning, you can only answer by pointing to the sounds, just as in painting there is not a meaning plus paint, but a meaning in paint, or significant paint, and no man can really express the meaning in any other way than in paint and in this paint. So in a poem, the true content and the true form neither exists nor can be imagined apart. When then you are asked whether the value of a poem lies in substance got by decomposing the poem and present, as such, only in reflective analysis, or in a form arrived at and existing in the same way, you will answer, it lies neither in one nor in the other, nor in any addition of them, but in the poem, where they are not. And when you are told that you are talking a priori metaphysics, you will not mind. Metaphysics does not mean anything. It is only a term of abuse applied to the effort to look at facts instead of repeating a priori fictions. We have, then, first, an antithesis of subject and poem. This is clear and valid and the question in which of them does the value lie is intelligible, and its answer is, in the poem. We have next a distinction of substance and form. If the substance means ideas, images, and the like taken alone, and the form means the measured language taken by itself, this is a possible distinction, but it is a distinction of things not in the poem, and the value lies in neither of them. If substance and form mean anything in the poem, then each is involved in the other, and the question in which of them the value lies has no sense. No doubt you may say, speaking loosely and perilously, that in this poet or poem the aspect of substance is the more noticeable, and in that the aspect of form, and you may pursue interesting discussions on this basis. But no principle or ultimate question of value is touched by them. And apart from that question, of course, I am not denying the usefulness and necessity of the distinction. We cannot dispense with it. To consider separately the action or the characters of a play, and separately its style or versification, is both legitimate and valuable, so long as we remember what we are doing. But the true critic in speaking of these apart never really thinks of them apart. The whole, the poetic experience, of which they are but aspects, is always in his mind, and he is always aiming at a richer, truer, more intense repetition of that experience. On the other hand, when the question of principle, of poetic value, is raised, these aspects must fall apart into components, separately conceivable, and then there arises two heresies, equally false, that the value lies in one of two things, both of which are outside the poem where its value cannot lie. On the heresy of the separate substance, a few additional words will suffice. This heresy is seldom formulated, but perhaps some unconscious holder of it may object, surely the action and characters of Hamlet are in the play, 
and surely I can retain these, though I have forgotten all the words. I admit that I do not possess the whole poem, but I possess a part, and the most important part. And I would answer, if we are not concerned with any question of principle, I accept all that you say except the last words, which do raise such a question. Speaking loosely, I agree that the action and characters, as you perhaps conceive them, together with a great deal more, are in the poem. Even then, however, you must not claim to possess all of this kind that is in the poem, for in forgetting the words you must have lost innumerable details of the action and the characters, and, when the question of value is raised, I must insist that the action and characters, as you conceive them, are not in Hamlet at all. If they are, point them out. You cannot do it. What you find at any moment of that succession of experiences called Hamlet is words. In these words, to speak loosely again, the action and characters, more of them than you can conceive apart, are focused. But your experience is not a combination of them, as ideas on the one side, with certain sounds on the other. It is an experience of something in which the two are indissolubly fused. If you deny this to be sure, I can make no answer, or can only answer that I have reason to believe that you cannot read poetically, or else are misinterpreting your experience. But if you do not deny this, then you will admit that the action and characters of the poem, as you separately imagine them, are no part of it, but a product of it in your reflective imagination, a faint analogue of one aspect of it, taken in detachment from the whole. Well, I do not deny, I would even insist, that, in the case of so long a poem as Hamlet, it may be necessary from time to time to interrupt the poetic experience in order to enrich it by forming such a product and dwelling on it. Nor, in a wide sense of poetic, do I question the poetic value of this product, as you think of it apart from the poem. It resembles our recollections of the heroes of history or legend, who move about in our imaginations, forms more real than living man, and are worth much to us though we do not remember anything they said. Our ideas and images of the substance of a poem have this poetic value, and more, if they are at all adequate. But they cannot determine the poetic value of a poem, for, not to speak of the competing claims of form, nothing that is outside the poem can do that, and they, as such, are outside it. Let us turn to the so-called form, style and versification. There is no such thing as mere form in poetry. All form is expression. Style may have indeed a certain aesthetic worth, impartial abstraction from the particular matter it conveys, as in a well-built sentence you may take pleasure in the build almost apart from the meaning. Even then style is expressive, presents to sense, for example, the order, ease, and rapidity with which ideas move in the writer's mind. But it is not expressive of the meaning of that particular sentence. And it is possible, interrupting poetic experience, to decompose it and abstract for comparatively separate consideration this nearly formed element of style. But the aesthetic value of style so taken is not considerable. You could not read with pleasure for an hour a composition which had no other merit. And in poetic experience you never apprehend this value by itself. The style is here expressive also of a particular meaning, or rather is one aspect of that unity whose other aspect is meaning so that what you apprehend may be called indifferently an expressed meaning or a significant form. Perhaps on this point I may in Oxford appeal to authority, that of Matthew Arnold and Walter Pater, the latter at any rate an authority whom the formalist will not despise. What is the gist of Pater's teaching about style, if it is not that, in the end, the one virtue of style is truth or adequacy, that the word, phrase, sentence, should express perfectly the writer's perception, feeling, image, or thought, so that, as we read a descriptive phrase of Keats, we exclaim, that is the thing itself, so that, to quote Arnold, the words are symbols equivalent with the thing symbolized, or, in our technical language, a form identical with its content. Hence, in true poetry it is, in strictness, impossible to express the meaning in any but its own words, or to change the words without changing the meaning. A translation of such poetry is not really the old meaning in a fresh dress. It is a new product, something like the poem, though, if one chooses to say so, 
more like it in the aspect of meaning than in the aspect of form no one who understands poetry it seems to me would dispute this were it not that falling away from his experience or misled by theory he takes the word meaning in a sense almost ludicrously inapplicable to poetry people say for instance steed and horse have the same meaning and in bad poetry they have but not in poetry that is poetry bring forth the horse the horse was brought in truth he was a noble steed says byron in mazeppa if the two words mean the same here transpose them bring forth the steed the steed was brought in truth he was a noble horse and ask again if they mean the same or let me take a line certainly very free from poetic diction to be or not to be that is the question you may say that this means the same as what is just now occupying my attention is the comparative disadvantages of continuing to live or putting an end to myself and for practical purposes the purpose for example of a coroner it does but as the second version altogether misrepresents the speaker at that moment of his existence while the first does represent him how can they for any but a practical or logical purpose be said to have the same sense hamlet was well able to unpack his heart with words but he will not unpack it with our paraphrases these considerations apply equally to versification if i take the famous line which describes how the souls of the dead stood waiting by the river imploring a passage from charon tendebantecu manus repei ulterioris amore and if i translate it and were stretching forth their hands in longing for the further bank the charm of the original has fled why has it fled partly but we have dealt with that because i have substituted for five words and those the words of virgil twelve words and those my own in some measure because i have turned into rhymeless prose a line of verse which as mere sound has unusual beauty but much more because in doing so i have also changed the meaning of virgil's line what that meaning is i cannot say virgil has said it but i can see this much that the translation conveys a far less vivid picture of the outstretched hands and of their remaining outstretched and a far less poignant sense of the distance of the shore and the longing of the souls and it does so partly because this picture and this sense are conveyed not only by the obvious meaning of the words but through the long-drawn sound of ten de banticue, through the time occupied by the five syllables and therefore by the idea of ulterioris, and though the identity of the long sound or in the penultimate syllables of ulterioris amore all this and much more apprehending not in this analytical fashion nor is added to the beauty of mere sound and to the obvious meaning but in unity with them and so as expressive of the poetic meaning of the whole it is always so in fine poetry the value of versification when it is indissolubly fused with meaning can hardly be exaggerated the gift for feeling it even more perhaps than the gift for feeling the value of diction is the specific gift for poetry as distinguished from other arts but versification taken as far as possible all by itself has a very different worth some aesthetic worth it has how much you may experience by reading poetry in any language of which you do not understand a syllable the pleasure is quite appreciable but it is not great nor an actual poetic experience do you meet with it as such at all for it is not added to the pleasure of the meaning when you read poetry that you do understand by some mystery the music is then the music of the meaning and the two are one however fond of versification you might be you would tire very soon of reading verses in chinese and before long of reading virgil and dante if you are ignorant of their languages but take the music as it is in the poem and there is a marvellous change now it gives a very echo to the seat where love is throned or carries far into your heart almost like the music itself the sound of old unhappy far-off things and battles long ago what then is to be said of the following sentence of the critic quoted before but when any one who knows what poetry is reads our noisy years seem moments in the being of the eternal silence 
he sees that quite independently of the meaning there is one note added to the articulate music of the world a note that will never leave off resounding till the eternal silence engulfs it i must think that the writer is deceiving himself for i could quite understand his enthusiasm if it were an enthusiasm for the music of the meaning but as for the music quite independently of the meaning so far as i can hear it thus and i doubt if any one who knows english can quite do so i find it gives some pleasure but only a trifling pleasure and indeed i venture to doubt whether considered as mere sound the words are at all exceptionally beautiful as virgil's line certainly is whatever may be the consequence i would back against them quite independently of the meaning this once famous stanza where is cupid's crimson motion billowy ecstasy of woe bear me straight meandering ocean where the stagnant torrents flow when poetry answers to its idea and is purely or almost purely poetic we find the identity of form and content and the degree of purity attained may be tested by the degree in which we feel it hopeless to convey the effect of a poem or passage in any form but its own where the notion of doing so is simply ludicrous you have quintessential poetry but a great part of even good poetry especially in long works is of a mixed nature and so we find in it no more than a partial agreement of a form and substance which remains to some extent this is so in many passages of shakespeare the greatest of poets when he chose but not always a conscientious poet passages where something was wanted for the sake of the plot but he did not care about it or was hurried the conception of the passage is then distinct from the execution and neither is inspired this is so also i think whenever we can truly speak of merely decorative effect we seem to perceive that the poet had a truth or fact philosophical agricultural social distinctly before him and then as we say clothed it in metrical and colored language most argumentative didactic or satiric poems are partly of this kind and in imaginative poems anything which is really a mere conceit is mere decoration we often deceive ourselves in this matter for what we call decoration has often a new and genuinely poetic content of its own but wherever there is mere decoration we judge the poetry to be not wholly poetic and so when wordsworth inveighed against poetic diction though he hurled his darts rather wildly what he was rightly aiming at was a phraseology not the living body of a new content but the mere worn-out body of an old one in pure poetry it is otherwise pure poetry is not the decoration of a preconceived and clearly defined matter it springs from the creative impulse of a vague imaginative mass pressing for development and definition if the poet already knew exactly what he meant to say why should he write the poem the poem would in fact already be written for only its completion can reveal even to him exactly what he wanted when he began and while he was at work he did not possess his meaning it possessed him it was not a fully formed soul asking for a body it was an inchoate soul in the inchoate body of perhaps two or three vague ideas and a few scattered phrases the growing of this body into its full stature and perfect shape was the same thing as the gradual self-definition of the meaning and this is the reason why such poems strike us as creations not manufacturers and have the magical effect which mere decoration cannot produce this is also the reason why if we insist on asking for the meaning of such a poem we can only be answered it means itself and so at last i may explain why i have troubled myself and you with what may seem an arid controversy about mere words it is not so these heresies which would make poetry a compound of two factors a matter common to it with the merest prose plus a poetic form as the heresy says a poetical substance plus a negligible form as the other says are not only untrue they are injurious to the dignity of poetry in an age already inclined to shrink from those higher realms where poetry touches religion and philosophy the formalist heresy encourages men to taste poetry as they would a fine wine which has indeed an aesthetic value but a small one and then the natural man finding an empty form hurls into it the matter of cheap pathos rancid sentiment vulgar humour bare lust ravenous vanity everything which in schiller's phrase the form should extirpate 
but which no mere form can extirpate. And the other heresy, which is indeed rather a practice than a creed, encourages us in the habit so dear to us of putting our own thoughts or fancies into the place of the poet's creation. What he meant by Hamlet, or the Ode to a Nightingale, or Apt Bulger, we say, is this or that which we knew already, and so we lose what he had to tell us. But he meant what he said, and he said what he meant. Poetry in this matter is not, as good critics of painting and music often affirm, different from the other arts. In all of them the content is one thing with the form. What Beethoven meant by his symphony, or Turner by his picture, was not something which you can name, but the picture and the symphony. Meaning they have, but what meaning can be uttered in no language but their own. And we know this, though some strange delusion makes us think the meaning has less worth, because we cannot put it into words. Well, it is just the same with poetry. But because poetry is words, we vainly fancy that some other words than its own will express its meaning, and they will do so no more, or, if you like to speak loosely, only a little more, than words will express the meaning of the Dresden Madonna. Something a little like it may be indeed express, and we may find analogues of the meaning of poetry outside it, which may help us to appropriate it. The other arts, the best ideas of philosophy or religion, much that nature and life offer us or force upon us are akin to it, but they are only akin. Nor is it the expression of them. Poetry does not present to imagination our highest knowledge or belief, and much less our dreams and opinions, but it, content and form in unity, embodies in own irreplaceable way something which embodies itself also in other irreplaceable ways, such as philosophy or religion. And just as each of these gives a satisfaction which the other cannot possibly give, so we find in poetry, which cannot satisfy the needs they meet, that which by their natures they cannot afford us. But we shall not find it fully if we look for something else. And yet, when all is said, the question will still recur, though now in quite another sense. What does poetry mean? This unique expression, which cannot be replaced by another, still seems to be trying to express something beyond itself, and this, we feel, is also what the other arts, and religion, and philosophy are trying to express, and that is what impels us to seek in vain to translate the one into the other. About the best poetry, and not only the best, there floats an atmosphere of infinite suggestion. The poet speaks to us of one thing, but in this one thing there seems to lurk the secret of all. He said what he meant, but his meaning seems to beckon away beyond itself, or rather to expand into something boundless, which is only focused in it, something also which, we feel, would satisfy not only the imagination, but the whole of us, that something within us, and without, which everywhere makes us seem to patch up fragments of a dream, part of which comes true, and part beats and trembles in the heart. Those who are susceptible to this effect of poetry find it not only, perhaps not most, in the ideals which she has sometimes described, but in a child song by Christina Rossetti about a mere crown of wind flowers, and in tragedies like Lear, where the sun seems to have set for ever. And it pierces them no less in Shelley's hopeless lament, O world, O life, O time, than in the rapturous ecstasy of his life of life. This all-embracing perfection cannot be expressed in poetic words, or words of any kind, nor yet in music or in color, but the suggestion of it is in much poetry, if not at all, and poetry has in this suggestion, this meaning, a great part of its value. We do it wrong, and we defeat our own purposes, when we try to bend it to them. We do it wrong, being so majestical, to offer it the show of violence, for it is as the air invulnerable, and our vain blows malicious mockery. It is a spirit. It comes we know not whence. It will not speak at our bidding, nor answer in our language. It is not our servant. It is our master. End of Poetry for Poetry's Sake by A. C. Bradley Read by Marianne Spiegel
excerpt from preparation for a christian life by soren kierkegaard eighteen fifty translated by lee m hollander in nineteen twenty three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org come hither all ye that labor and are heavy laden and i will give you rest what enormous multiplicity what an almost boundless diversity of people invited for a man a lowly man may indeed try to enumerate only a few of these diversities but he who invites must invite all men even if every one specially and individually the invitation goes forth then along the highways and the byways and along the loneliest paths ay goes forth where there is a path so lonely that one man only and no one else knows of it and goes forth where there is but one track the track of the wretched one who fled along that path with his misery that and no other track goes forth even where there is no path to show how one may return even there the invitation penetrates and by itself easily and surely finds its way back most easily indeed when it brings the fugitive along to him that issued the invitation come hither come hither all ye also thou and thou and thou too thou loneliest of all fugitives thus the invitation goes forth and remains standing wheresoever there is a parting of the ways in order to call out ah just as a trumpet call of the soldiers is directed to the four quarters of the globe likewise does this invitation sound wherever there is a meeting of roads with no uncertain sound for who would then come but with the certitude of eternity it stands by the parting of the ways where worldly and earthly sufferings have set down their crosses and calls out come hither all ye poor and wretched ones ye who in poverty must slave in order to assure yourselves not of a care-free but of a toilsome future ah bitter contradiction to have to slave for assuring oneself of that under which one groans of that which one flees ye despised and overlooked ones about whose existence no one ay no one is concerned not so much even as about some domestic animal which is of greater value ye sick and halt and blind and deaf and crippled come hither ye bedridden ay come hither ye too for the invitation makes bold to invite even the bedridden to come ye lepers for the invitation breaks down all differences in order to unite all it wishes to make good the hardship caused by the difference in men the difference which seats one as a ruler over millions in possessions of all gifts of fortune and drives another one out into the wilderness and why ah the cruelty of it because ah the cruel human inference because he is wretched indescribably wretched why then because he stands in need of help or at any rate of compassion and why then because human compassion is a wretched thing which is cruel when there is the greatest need of being compassionate and compassionate only when at bottom it is not true compassion ye sick of heart ye who only through your anguish learn to know that a man's heart and an animal's heart are two different things and what it means to be sick at heart what it means when the physician may be right in declaring one sound of heart and yet heart sick ye whom faithlessness deceived and whom human sympathy for the sympathy of man is rarely late in coming whom human sympathy made a target for mockery all ye wronged and aggrieved and ill-used all ye noble ones who as any and everybody will be able to tell you deservedly reap the reward of ingratitude for why were ye simple enough to be noble why foolish enough to be kindly and disinterested and faithful 
all ye victims of cunning of deceit of backbiting of envy whom baseness chose as its victim and cowardice left in the lurch whether now ye be sacrificed in remote and lonely places after having crept away in order to die or whether ye be trampled under foot in the thronging crowds where no one asks what rights ye have and no one what wrongs ye suffer and no one where ye smart or how ye smart whilst the crowd with brute force tramples you into the dust come ye hither the invitation stands at the parting of the ways where death parts death and life come hither all ye that sorrow and ye that vainly labor for indeed there is rest in the grave but to sit by a grave or to stand by a grave or to visit a grave all that is far from lying in the grave and to read to oneself again and again one's own words which one knows by heart the epitaph which one devised oneself and understands best namely who it is that lies buried here all that is not the same as to lie buried oneself in the grave there is rest but by the grave there is no rest for it is said so far and no farther and so you may as well go home again but however often whether in your thoughts or in fact you return to that grave you will never get any farther you will not get away from the spot and this is very trying and is by no means rest come ye hither therefore here is the way by which one may go farther here is rest by the grave rest from the sorrow over loss or rest in the sorrow of loss through him who everlastingly reunites those that are parted and more firmly than nature unites parents with their children and children with their parents for alas they were parted and more closely than the minister unites husband and wife for alas their separation did come to pass and more indissolubly than the bond of friendship unites friend with friend for alas it was broken separation penetrated everywhere and brought with it sorrow and unrest but here is rest come hither also ye who had your abodes assigned to you among the graves ye who are considered dead to human society but neither missed nor mourned not buried and yet dead that is belonging neither to life nor to death ye alas to whom human society cruelly closed its doors and from whom no grave has as yet opened itself in pity come hither ye also here is rest and here is life the invitation stands at the parting of the ways where the road of sin turns away from the enclosure of innocence ah come hither ye are so close to him but a single step in the opposite direction and ye are infinitely far from him very possibly ye do not stand in need of rest nor grasp fully what that means but still follow the invitation so that he who invites may save you from a predicament out of which it is so difficult and dangerous to be saved and so that being saved you may stay with him who is the saviour of all likewise of innocence for even if it were possible that innocence be found somewhere and altogether pure why should not innocence also need a saviour to keep it safe from evil the invitation stands at the parting of the ways where the road of sin turns away to enter more deeply into sin come hither all ye who have strayed and have been lost whatever may have been your error and sin whether one more pardonable in the sight of man and nevertheless perhaps more frightful or one more terrible in the sight of man and yet perchance more pardonable whether it be one which became known here on earth or one which though hidden yet is known in heaven and even if ye found pardon here on earth without finding rest in your souls or found no pardon because ye did not seek it or because ye sought it in vain ah return and come hither here is rest 
the invitation stands at the parting of the ways where the road of sin turns away for the last time and to the eye is lost in perdition ah return return and come hither do not shrink from the difficulties of the retreat however great do not fear the irksome way of conversion however laboriously it may lead to salvation whereas sin with winged speed and growing pace leads forward or downward so easily so indescribably easy as easily in fact as when a horse altogether freed from having to pull cannot even with all his might stop the vehicle which pushes him into the abyss do not despair over each relapse which the god of patience has patience enough to pardon and which a sinner should surely have patience enough to humble himself under nay fear nothing and despair not he that saith come hither he is with you on the way from him come help and pardon on that way of conversion which leads to him and with him is rest come hither all all ye with him is rest and he will raise no difficulties he does but one thing he opens his arms he will not first ask you you sufferer as righteous men alas are accustomed to even when willing to help are you not perhaps yourself the cause of your misfortune have you nothing with which to reproach yourself it is so easy to fall into this human error and from appearances to judge a man's success or failure for instance if a man is a cripple or deformed or has an unprepossessing appearance to infer that therefore he is a bad man or when a man is unfortunate enough to suffer reverses so as to be ruined or as to go down in the world to infer that therefore he is a vicious man ah and this is such an exquisitely cruel pleasure this being conscious of one's own righteousness as against the sufferer explaining his afflictions as god's punishment so that one does not even dare to help him or asking him that question which condemns him and flatters your own righteousness before helping him but he will not ask you thus will not in such cruel fashion be your benefactor and if you are yourself conscious of your sin he will not ask about it will not break still further the bent reed but raise you up if you will but join him he will not point out by way of contrast and place you outside of himself so that your sin will stand out as still more terrible but he will grant you a hiding place within him and hidden within him your sins will be hidden for he is the friend of sinners let him but behold a sinner and he not only stands still opening his arms and says come hither nay but he stands and waits as did the father of the prodigal son or he does not merely remain standing and waiting but goes out to search as the shepherd went forth to search for the strayed sheep or as the woman went to search for the lost piece of silver he goes nay he has gone but an infinitely longer way than any shepherd or any woman for did he not go the infinitely long way from being god to becoming man which he did to seek sinners end of preparation for a christian life by soren kierkegaard eighteen fifty translated by lee m hollander in 1923. Emergency Feature from the Weymouth Gazette, 1914. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Berard. Emergency Feature from the weymouth gazette of july third nineteen fourteen in line with the telephone company's slogan 
service first district traffic manager f d field of the quincy district told a gazette and transcript reporter today of a new emergency feature which the telephone company has adopted for the benefit of the public and without cost for several years he said our company has been doing everything possible to handle quickly and accurately emergency calls for the police fire department hospitals and ambulances now we are adding to this list all calls for pull motors in cases of electric shock asphyxiation partial drowning and other accidents where the administration of oxygen may be of vital importance all such calls may be made from a pay station as well as from a business or residence telephone especially during the summer there are many instances where the prompt service of pull motors will save life to this end instructions have been issued to our operators to be quick cool-headed and resourceful in responding to calls of this kind if a person calls in and says emergency pull motor the operator will immediately endeavor to put him into communication with the telephone at the place where the pull motor is located not only that but she will ask him if he wants a doctor and if a doctor is required this fact will be communicated to a supervisor who will proceed to get a doctor while the operator continues her effort to reach the telephone station at which the pull motor is located if she finds the line is busy she will interrupt conversation by explaining the emergency in emergency cases much depends upon the person making the call the varying requirements in connection with a pull motor case make it essential that the person calling shall state the nature of the accident the location of the victim and such other information as may be deemed pertinent it may be desirable to send several physicians or to call ambulances and the operator cannot know this unless the person making the call tells her a complete list of pull motors has been placed in the operating room of every city and town where there are pull motors this wonderful invention has saved the lives of persons who were supposed to have died thirty minutes before it was applied it is not wise to assume therefore that all hope has departed merely because a person's breathing has stopped in some cases it has been necessary to continue this form of artificial respiration for hours in handling these calls the operators are admonished to think clearly and act quickly if the same admonition can be impressed upon the public this cooperation ought to save a number of lives before the summer is ended end of emergency feature from the weymouth gazette of july third nineteen fourteen ridicule is a test of faith by joseph priestley seventeen thirty three to eighteen hundred and four this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org from remarks on dr beattie's essay had i been acquainted with these new principles i might have saved myself a good deal of trouble but i am apprehensive that i should hardly have escaped a great deal of ridicule and we ought not to forget that ridicule has been deemed the test of truth as well as this new common sense i think with equal reason and i flatter myself that the reign of this new usurper will not be much longer than that of his predecessor to whom he is very nearly related in this some may think that i only mean to be jocular but really i am serious why was ridicule ever thought to be the test of truth but because the things at which we can laugh were supposed to be so absurd that their falsehood was self-evident so that there was no occasion to examine any further we were supposed to feel them to be false 
and what is a feeling but the affection of a sense in reality therefore this new doctrine of common sense being the standard of truth is no other than ridicule being the standard of truth the words are different but not the things i should be glad to see so acute a metaphysician as dr reed so fine a writer as dr beattie and to adopt dr beattie's compliment so elegant an author as dr oswald separately employed to ascertain the precise difference between these two schemes in my opinion the chief difference besides what i have said above consists in this that the one may be called the sense of truth and the other the sense of falsehood there is also some doubt whether shaftesbury was really in earnest in proposing ridicule as the test of truth many think that he could never be so absurd whereas there can be no doubt but that this triumvirate of authors are perfectly serious there is however another difference that will strongly recommend the claims of common sense in preference to those of ridicule which is that this was advanced in support of infidelity but that in support of religion but i should think that the greater weight we have to support the stronger buttresses we should use End of Ridicule as a Test of Faith by Joseph Priestley, 1713 to 1804.